Okay. Um, okay. Thank you for for being here. Uh, we'll try to to make this part uh, as easier as is possible. Talking about anatomy sometimes is a little bit boring, but it could be a necessary step in that uh, the orbiter uh, something is changing. Oh, at least for me, uh, some some paradigm uh, has really changed, and so the orbiter is becoming something new that more a site of pathology and uh, could be now to be considered also a, a corridor for the deeper areas so in the skull base uh, in the uh, in the orbital content itself of course and so the basis of course is knowing the anatomy and uh, running through this anatomy you understand exactly that the structure are uh, sometimes in one part and some uh, sometimes in another part just like uh, in uh, just like in every kind uh, of other human body regions. So uh, what about uh, anatomy for transorbital or orbital approaches? Uh, I mean that we can talk about everything. Uh, we have a lot of uh, transorbital approach, transcutaneous approaches and transconge uh, approaches. Uh, there is a lot of description about that. And uh, you have can perform a lot of uh, orbitotomies because I, I don't want to see, I don't want to uh, make these lessons uh, just an endoscopic lesson. So I want to understand, I want to show you that the endoscope is just only a tool for visualization and uh, just to uh, consider that uh, there are several approaches uh, that are, can be really useful to get to deeper areas. And uh, I uh, skip a lot of this and uh, okay, it could be your face now because uh, it sometimes is a little bit unfamiliar with the ENT, uh, this kind of approach. So just to focus on so something that can remain with you, just to give you some advices, uh, I would like to, uh, to consider uh, the one of my preferred approaches, uh, the superior eyelid approaches, uh, it's, a not a, um, it's not a new approach, it's something that uh, uh, the plastic surgeon, maxillofacial surgeon, and the now ENTs and, uh, uh, are used since, since a lot of years. It's a quite easy approach to be learned, and uh, given the fact I want to be pratic and I want to lose your time, uh, which are the main area here. Of course, if you look at an eyelid, uh, the best uh, idea is that, okay, where I can go? Uh, the best way and the best uh, situation is try to be uh, in the lower part in order to concede to the fact that uh, with the eye open, the incision in the superior eyelid is uh, uh, quite neglected, is quite hidden. And uh, if the skin of the patient is good, uh, this video shows you uh, probably in real time because it's really easy to get this. And from the anatomical viewpoint, the, the only things that you should keep in mind is the position of the orbicularis oculi muscle. And it is by far more easy to find this muscle in the live situation in vivo than in a cadaveric where the fixed specimens can create more problems in identifying this one. So this, the first step is to make an incision here, and my advice is not to go too much high in the eyelid, and then find the undersurface of the muscle, and then go to the uh, superolateral part. And it's one of the, the, the approach that you can use to find the bony here. And once you find the bone, you are in a very safe area. You can dissect the periosteum from the inner surface here and create the space for working. One of the rules in the skull-based surgery is keep intact soft tissue and remove the bone. You have to create room for in your instruments. So uh, these are, of course, some dissection. And this is the summary. And the point that you have to keep with you are extremely uh, few and uh, easy to be remembered. The position of the bicolaris oculi muscle, it's quite really easy to find it and then dissecting until finding the superior lateral part of the orbital rim. 
that means that uh, if you want to uh, make some uh, kind of dissection, uh, the first thing is just to infiltrate because it's easier and it's bloodless, the field of courts, and then create such kind of incision. And according to you, you can go for uh, an extension laterally if you need more space, if you need uh, to create a, a, a more room for an instrument and, and remove the bone. And once you got it, you can find, uh, of course, the bony structure. And as I told you, the main step is finding that bony structure here. Then, usually under endoscopic assistance, but this is, as a repeat, uh, not uh, a dogmatic rule. When you find that area, you can dissect, and if you want to create a corridor, the advice is, of course, to spare the periorbita. That means that you can consider this kind of approach at least in two parts, and so uh, one is uh, periorbita violating and one is periorbita sparing. That means that in one case you can use the orbit as a corridor for deeper areas, of course, and then the other is an approach to getting inside of the orbit. So you have found your room, you have dissected the orbita, and then you have to create your room for instrument. The first step is finding on the lateral side of your field, the temporalis muscle. So I would say that if you want to standardize this approach, once you got the supralateral part of the, uh, of the orbital rim, the step is finding that one. So here you can recognize the inferior orbital fissure here. Here is the superior orbital fissure. They are in connection one to each other. And this is the position of the uh, medial part, the medial aspect of the uh, temporalis muscle. Once you got it, you can try and you can define, so anatomically speaking, the main rule is find the superior and the inferior orbital feature. feature. As a, um, I'm talking about a superior eyelid approach, and there are some variations that could be interesting to discuss, but we have no time. So once you got it, and once you are in a safe place, you can try to design your craniectomies and understanding the anatomy behind that. Because through this corridor, you can see the lateral part of the frontal lobes, and of course, you can see the lateral part of the temporal lobe, and going deep and going more inferior, you can control the flow of the middle cranial fossa. So in that situation, anatomically, the position is that in that case, you are on the lateral side, is a right side, here you have the anterior cranial fossa. According to the disease you are going to treat, the uh, steps are of course a little bit different, but the same concept as a standardization uh, can be applied every time. So just to keep this easy checklist is orbicularis oculi muscle, superior part of the orbital rim, dissect the periorbita, and then find the uh, superior and inferior orbital fish. Now you move where you want, to the anterior, to the middle cranial fossa, and at least if you need, going even above, but it depends on the pathology, because it's not so easy to do in a clinical situation, a superomedial dissection, because removing the lesser wing of the sphenoid and performing an anterior cranioidectomy is by far is easy, or I want to say easy, but it's possible to be performed transorbitally, and you can see, you can remain extradural and remove all the anterior cranioid process, but it depends on the pathology that creates space. So anatomically speaking, the medial part is possible to be reached via superior eyelid approach, but in, it is not to apply. I think it's very risky because you push too much the superior orbital fissure content. And in that situation, this is the anterior cranoid process here, just over there. And uh, the concept is that uh, not always you can find in anatomy, you can do in, in clinical situation. 
So this, just to show you anatomically speaking, what I, uh, what I, I told you before, so you're on the right side, the superior orbital fissure, just over there, the superior orbital fissure. This is a craniectomy in the posterior, in the middle cranial fossa here. The anterior cranoid process in the at least the most frontal part of the anterior cranoid process is just there. In that case, uh, the pathology was so big that it uh, create room for you, and it's a normal rule in skull-based approaches. But to keep in mind the position, you are running something like this. And in this situation, you are completely extradural. That means that you have a great advantage for the patient if you can stay there for the uh, biological reason of the pathology. But if you want to go even intradurally, the uh, step, of course, is to completely expose the dura, and uh, this is a middle cranial fossa approach, and uh, open the dura and see what is behind. Most of the time, um, we perform this approach for uh, sphenoorbital meningioma, but uh, the, another speaker will talk about this more uh, precisely than me, and I don't want to lose your time because it, my lesson is mainly related to the anatomy. So once you got the middle cranial fossa dura, you can open that dura or you can peel that dura because anatomically speaking, there is a very important point in the lateral aspect of this superior orbital fissure that is called the meningo-orbital bandle that neurosurgical community knows very well because allows you to split the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus in the dura propria and in the inner layer. And from a pure anatomical concept, this area is uh, virtually bloodless, but it's not so true. But anyway, is a is an area that allows you an extra dural dissection, reaching what the Meckel's cave that is posteriorly. Uh, these are anatomically uh, demonstration, and you can go even in live situation there, exposing the cilium fissure, and in that case, you need to remove, this is the anterior cranial base and the middle cranial base, the left side, temporalis muscle and superior orbital fissure, and this is the position of the lesser ring of the sphenoid. This is by far the most difficult part to remove the lesser ring of the sphenoid because of the sphenoidal ridge that is uh, just like uh, um, a spur reaching and going posteriorly inside of the middle cranial base. So technically, it's uh, the most difficult part to remove that. Uh, this is the lateral part of the cavernous sinus. This is what I told you before. And uh, um, the possibility to dissect is the left side, and you see the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus split in between the temporal dura here and the, uh, the gasalian ganglion. So you are in the Meckel's cave in that position here, and you can appreciate all the nerves in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, and this is still, until now, an extradural approach. So, uh, and dissection and an in vivo situation, just to keep in mind where you can go. Summarize, but it seems to be a lot of things, but I would say that it's much easier to get confidence with this than in respect to the transnasal approaches. You need more time to get uh, very skilled in a transnasal approach. The summary is uh, the eyelid work, two points, orbicularis oculi muscle, and then the superior orbital is the superolateral part of the orbital bone. The dissection, and then you have room. The two fissures, you have to define the superior orbital fissure and the inferior orbital fissure, and then drill where you need, of course. So just a few words, and I think I'm going to finish. This is a nice uh, dissection showing that area. Uh, using a superior eyelid approach is not so difficult to go behind the middle cranial fossa and expose that area is a transnasal view, is a transnasal view, 
And uh, this is a, a tribute to my maestro, Manfred Schabischer, that, sh that show me and teach me that anatomy is still the same, no matter the way. And this is what you see via superior eyelid approach, endoscopically assisted or not. It's not a matter of discussion. So the periosteum of the infratemporal fossa just over there, the dura of the middle cranial fossa, we are on the right side in that case. So you have to imagine here the cavernous sinus and disease V3 that coming out from the foramen ovale. And so the relationship between V3 and the station tube and the skull base is still the same, no matter the way you are looking at. So uh, going with dissection, and uh, I don't want to, uh, I think that it's uh, quite enough just to uh, show you which are the region that you are going to treat. And recently, uh, very good paper has been published about the possibility to perform what is neurosurgical community called and the uh, correctly called Cavazzi approach transorbitally. That means the removal of the uh, petrous apex to get space to work in the uh, region of the, uh, the petrochival region uh, without uh, also in this case transgressing the dura. So you are seeing here, it's a, a not very beautiful dissection, but anatomically it's nice. The petrous apex on the right side, you see the pons just over there, the carotid here, and this is the obducens nerve, this is the root of the trigeminal nerve. That is a, this is not a cavaz, this is the uh, inner ear, the, sorry, seven and eight, of course, and you show, uh, you can appreciate here the Abducens nerve entering here, here is the Dorello canal. So this is anatomy, and this is something that you can, of course, need to know, but I'm not here, of course, from a technical viewpoint. The last consideration, and I think I'm, I'm going to finish, is that the orbit is a, con is a corridor, perfect. You can use the orbit. Uh, the concern about the pressure on the eye, I would be happy to discuss about uh, uh, this item. But uh, the uh, interesting part of this is that also the orbital content can be uh, approached, can be reached in, uh, in this situation. And uh, it was the first time I realized and I saw the superior division of the oculomotor nerve inside of the petrous of the petrous um, of the orbital apex here is the right side. So this is the dissection. This is a, a schematic drawing showing the position of the normally position of the upper division of the oculomotor nerve. Normally the nerves split in the orbital apex, but sometimes can split also in the the most uh, distal part of the cavernous sinus. So you can recognize the ophthalmic artery that, uh, uh, according to literature, in 80% of the cases it runs above the stem of the uh, optic nerve in, in that part of the orbit. And you see the superior rectus muscle complex with the levator palpebrae just over there. And the, uh, the um, uh, superior division of the oculomotor nerve. Um, I think that is, uh, is the end of my presentation because the anatomy, anatomy is still uh, the basis for that. I uh, tried to put anatomy into a practical viewpoint and I tried to fix the few points I consider necessary because uh, you have a lot of opportunities for transorbital approaches. Uh, of course, one of, every one of you choose uh, one approach instead of the other. I consider very comfortable with the superior eyelid approach and the point, the orbicularis, oculimastro, the orbital rim, and then dissection, then the fissures are really few points. And once you have the time to dissect this, you can understand how easy to be performed. Uh, thank you for your time and attention.